Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming out. And thank you to everyone that's streaming online. Looks like the numbers are huge. This is awesome. Uh, so thank you. Uh, so we are here to uh, release our beer, Things We Don't Say. It's a, um, it's a collaboration beer that Eagle Park started out in Milwaukee. So if you get a chance to head out to Wisconsin, I suggest checking them out. Um, but kind of a funny story with, with this beer, when it was first announced that they were doing it, um, could have been more than 15 minutes after they announced it and, and did all the marketing. I had seen it and I was like, oh man, that would be kind of cool because, you know, this industry really struggles with mental health and talking about it and the stigma that goes with it. And it, it could have been 20 minutes after that, that uh, our first speaker, Elizabeth, sent me a message on Facebook and said, hey, we should do this. This is something that's really important to me and something that I, uh, and something that's really passionate to me and I said oh man that's really weird and then couldn't have been more than a few minutes later that our uh, marketing and events guru Sam said hey we should do this this is really cool and so it was kind of a sign right away that that we should probably start talking about mental health specifically in our industry um, for those that aren't familiar with the brewing industry it's a very volatile and very stressful uh, business to be in because you deal with two uh, really sort of different things. You deal with the production side where you have a team that works really, really hard to produce something. And then you have a retail customer facing side that is in charge of trying to convey that message that those in the back of the house work so hard to make to a customer that may or may not know what goes into it. And oftentimes those two things clash. So not only is it really stressful in your work environment, but as a team, it gets really stressful because you're you're oftentimes on two different sides. The production team really doesn't care as much about what the what the front facing customer sees, and vice versa. And so, um, it, it's obvious that we deal with a lot of mental health issues. And piled on top of that is this is a very male dominated industry, and traditionally men don't like to talk about it. It's always been a faux pas. Uh, you know, a lot of us grew up. Uh, that if we talked about our emotions, it was it was a it was a not a very masculine thing and not something we should do. So uh, I'm really excited to uh, take on this beer. I'm really excited to take on this challenge. Um, we've teamed up with the Living Foundation right here. So if you're not familiar with them, they're out of uh, Anoka, a really good foundation, and we will have information uh, starting today and every day from here on out. Information that if you are someone struggling with mental health and something's going on, they will be there, they will be a resource for you. And they are just an outstanding organization. And if you have time, uh, I suggest you reach out to them. Uh, secondly, on your tables, you should see a little QR code from Slido. Um, that is an opportunity for you if you have questions. Uh, afterwards, we'll have everybody up here to kind of talk about it. Please scan that. If you have questions, please ask questions. Um, you don't know what you don't know. So, um, so our, our first guest is uh, Elizabeth, which is someone that, uh, again, was the first person that reached out to me and said we should do this beer. This is something that is very important. Um, and as a community, we, we are predicated on helping each other. And so for her to reach out was pretty awesome. So she's going to tell you her story. And uh, yeah, with that, Here's Elizabeth. Thank you. Hi, I go by Elizabeth or Beth. So either one is good. As long as you don't call me Liz, we'll get along just fine. Uh, welcome. Thank you for being here. I believe my mental health uh, started when my parents were divorced when I was about five. I didn't realize it at a time. It was probably recently that I really put that together, that it really really affected me and I didn't know how to deal with it. Oh, uh, later on, as a freshman in high school, I had a best friend that told me she couldn't be my friend anymore because I brought her down, quotes, I brought her down and she couldn't live like that. To this day, I give her props for being that strong as a freshman in high school to come up to me and say, I can't do this. You need to do something so you can live differently. That prompted me to talk to my mom. 
um, my mom was there for me. She got me therapy. I was diagnosed shortly after with depression, obviously, and then I also had um, migraines on top of that. So two things that commonly go together. After some time, I was doing good. I got through my high school years. I went to a tech school for two years, doing pretty good, wasn't in therapy all that often still taking meds, didn't want to take meds because of the stigma against it, so I hid it from most people. And then fast forward to uh, the fall of 1999, I, I would go and hide in our bedroom that we had, we had a third bedroom, and find the smallest place that I could find and tuck myself in there and just cry. My husband to this day sorry I wasn't gonna get emotional to this day if it wasn't for him I don't know where I would be he was the one that hey you need to go find some help you need to do something for yourself and so I did got a good therapist went through meds again was doing great uh, fast forward to November of 2000, we found out we were expecting our oldest son, Orlo. <laughs> Sorry. Um, which was great. As soon as I found out I was pregnant, I stopped all meds. Not recommended. Don't do that. <laughs> Doctors will yell at you. However, during my pregnancy, I was happy. I was in a really good place. I loved being pregnant. Um, and that carried through after I delivered, um, everything went good, went back to work, and the first plane hit the World Trade Center. Yes, my first day back to work after having a child was November or September 11th. I worked on the 20th floor of the IDS building at the time. We had only been on that floor for a couple of months. They evacuated the building, but forgot that we were there. So, um, needless to say, I did go home that day. I found a ride, got to the park and ride, and went to my cousin who was watching my son and held him and thought, what the hell did I do bringing a child into this crazy world? Um, that's when I decided that no matter what his questions were, that I was gonna answer them as honestly and age appropriate as I possibly could. And we've gone from there. Um, then in 2005, October, we had our second son. Again, I stopped all that. <laughs> Doctors don't like that. Uh, but I felt good during pregnancy. I, the hormones were the right thing for me. It made me feel great. Um, however, after delivering o Owen, our second son, it was about two weeks and postpartum hit and it hit hard. Uh, it was not a pretty sight. I was unable to function for the most part. And then I'm going to backtrack a little bit. So before I had Owen, uh, Orlo and I were in a car accident. I had come home from work on October 11th and we went to the chiropractor and we were coming home and I got uh, T-boned in the driver's side door and the car flipped. We ended up in the median of Highway 65 in Blaine and that's where I think a lot of the trauma came from and I know that's where the post-traumatic stress came from that I didn't deal with until years later. It was after Owen was born and the post-traumatic stress really hit and the mental stress of just everyday life got to be really hard. Um, went through therapists, went through meds, all that fun stuff. Not really, but you do what you need to do to try to make yourself get through each and every day. Um, I finally found a therapist that I worked really well together with. I told her my goal. I said, I don't wanna be on meds. 
and I want to be able to do what I want to do and live my life. And we sat down, we wrote those goals. She told me flat out, this isn't going to happen in a year. This isn't going to happen in two years. This is going to take time. We worked together about six, seven years. Um, and we started slow. We worked through each thing to a point where we were working on weaning back my meds. And then we also worked on the post-traumatic stress that I had that I hadn't dealt with. Um, the post-traumatic stress for me, I wasn't able to get in an elevator with more than four people. I wasn't able to sit anywhere in a restaurant without my back to the wall. I wasn't able to get on a bus and sit anywhere on the bus. You guys sitting here would have freaked me out at that point in time. Um, but we worked on that. I did what they call prolonged exposure. <laughs> um, PE. It's hard. It is not for the faint of heart. Uh, lots of tears, lots of stress, but it worked. I can now get in an elevator. I can talk to people. I am able to do so much. I'm not stuck with where can I sit in this restaurant? Oh, you can't set us there because I can't see everybody. It is so free. Shortly after I completed that, and this is a happy, um, my sons and I took a trip to Arizona without my husband. I hadn't gone anywhere without my husband in I don't know how many years, eight years, nine years, something like that. He was always by my side. He was always there for me. Um, so that giving my independence back was huge. And I, I did that trip to prove to myself that I can do stuff on my own and that I'm able to move forward. And that is one of the reasons I'm here. And another reason is I spent so much time working on myself and realizing that the accident that I was in should not be here. I, I shouldn't have walked away. Not a broken bone, nothing. I had soft tissue damage and a, a center brain injury, which is very small compared to what could have happened when you're hit in the driver's door and your car flips. So with that realization, I decided that I needed to do something and help others. Um, in 2018, I started an anxiety and depression group at work. We now have um, between 20 and 30 people attending once a month. Um, we have two different sessions. So between the two, we're averaging 60 to 80 people every month that are involved. And then as Jeremy said, I reached out to him because this is something that I am passionate about. It is something that I really feel that if I can speak out, we can, as a group, we can start breaking the stigma and realizing that others deal with mental health and we're just as human as the next. So with that, thank you. I appreciate your time for listening. have uh, my high school friend who is a comedian, Chan Daniels. I don't know if you've ever heard of him or not, but he is an advocate as well for mental health. So he's going to speak a little bit here in a video for us. Hi everybody. I'm Chad Daniels and uh, I'm a stand-up comedian and also just a huge advocate for, uh, for getting help when you have problems. I got divorced about six years ago and I felt all of these emotions I had never felt before and I had no idea how to deal with them. Not a clue. And I think that's because in high school I took algebra and algebra two and geometry and trigonometry and calculus. I took all of those, but I never took one class on how to deal with emotion. And I was so angry at the time so angry about everything and I was wondering like, why am I so angry and I believe it's because little boys are emotionally stunted I think we are I think when you're sad when you're a little boy you get told things like oh you got to grow a pair you got to man up I'll give you something to cry about right we hear those things and so we know well I can't be sad 
Or if we're scared, we go, ah, don't be a pussy. We hear stuff like that. And it's like, well, we can't be scared. But if we punch a wall, we hear, ah, that's just boys being boys. So we know, okay, well, if I punch something, that's okay. But if I cry or if I'm scared, that's not okay. So what do we do? As men, you see so many angry men, but I bet if you break it down, there's sadness or fear beneath it. And I know not a lot of guys want to hear that because they're like, hey, I'm not a wimp. Well, it's not about being a wimp. You're allowed to be scared. You're allowed to be sad. Men that are 65 years old or older, right? Doesn't matter your color or your soci socioeconomic uh, status. That's the group with the highest rate of suicide. And it's probably because we feel useless because 65, you might be retired or you're, you know, your testosterone is dropping and so you're not as strong as you used to be because that's that's what we correlate being manly with strength and and being able to provide but there's just there's so much worth left in you that it's just so unfortunate that we're losing all these fathers and grandpas you know they have so much to teach but they don't feel useful so how can we how can we start to right the ship. Well, I think it comes, it comes down to a lot of dads. Dads, you, you gotta let your kids be kids. They don't have to be men at five years old. Let them be sad, let them be scared. They're still gonna grow up to be men, right? You're not, I, I, we have this thing in our heads, like I'm not raising a wimp. You're right, you're not. You are raising a mentally stable human being. So let them be sad. And let them do that. And, and if you need therapy, ask for help. We ask for help. We'll ask our friends to help move. We'll ask our friends to help us get a job, right? We'll ask for, for help in other ways, but we just think like we're supposed to automatically know how to handle all of our emotions. You know, you hear guys go like, hey, how much do you bench? Well, let me ask you this. How many people in your life can count on you to be emotionally stable and available to them? In my opinion, that is the true sign of being manly. Thanks. Awesome. Uh, let's give it up for Elizabeth. Talk about brave. So, one thing that's really, you know, that was for you, Elizabeth. That was for you. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Uh, what, one of the most amazing and great things about being a co-op is the community and the people that you have around you. Um, so our next speaker, Maddie, who is just an, an unbelievable person, a human being, and to be able to lean into the community to help each other is something that can never be forgotten. And that's why I'll say from here on out, there, there will never be a brewery that's better than Broken Clock because this community is unbelievable. So with that, uh, Maddie is a licensed psychotherapist. Uh, so she's just gonna, you know, really kind of give us a, a, a breakdown and some resources um, and just kind of kind of help us through this this walk that we're so, of us are so afraid to take. Again, Elizabeth, well, I guess I'm, <laughs> these guys love talking about mental health. I love that. Uh, so with that, uh, let's please round of applause for Maddie. Hello. Most people, what, what people online can't see, and hi everybody online, is that standing behind me, I'm greeted by many, many of the faces of my family and friends. And one thing that's pretty great is I am a licensed psychotherapist, and that's due in large part to my mom who is my hero and is a psychotherapist, and my aunt, who is also here and is a social worker. So I work for Bridging Hope Counseling. Um, I've been there for a year and some change, and it is my privilege to get to every day sit with people in their stories and in their pain and walk through parts of life with people. And I'm super passionate about mental health. I love that Broken Clock is, is doing this. You wouldn't think of a, a good marriage between beer and mental health, and yet here we are. Um, so what I wanted to talk about is just kind of some, what we call in the business, psychoeducation about mental health and about suicidality and suicide awareness. So just if there's any kids watching, just a heads up, I will be talking about some tough topics, suicide, suicidality, 
um, self-harm. So just if there's any kids, just, just know that I will be covering a little bit of that. So one thing I wanted to talk about is risk factors. Um, and in suicide awareness, we call a risk factor. That's something in life that increases kind of the chances or the odds that somebody would struggle with suicidality or with suicidal thoughts. And a risk factor, so some examples of those would be um, substance use. If somebody has a diagnosable mental health concern, if somebody's experienced trauma in the past, um, or if somebody has suffered a recent loss, like a job loss um, or the loss of a family member. So those are all things that can kind of push us towards, towards really having a tough time and struggling with something like suicidality. So if you, if you are walking through life with somebody, just know that those are all things that, that can kind of bring about suicidality. Um, on the flip side, there's what's called a protective factor. And those are things in life that really promote mental health and, and keep people stable, keep people feeling happy. And protective factors are literally what's what I can see right in front of me is being connected to family, um, having friends that are reliable people that you can count on, people that are consistent, being part of a community like Broken Clock, having a sense of belonging, um, that can be a huge protective factor for mental health. Um, Having a life that's purposeful, so doing things like brewing delicious beer um, or doing things with your life that you find meaningful or purposeful, that can be a really big protective factor for mental health. And one thing that I was, when I was doing some research to think about to th- what I wanted to say, I found out um, there's a SAMHSA, which is a nonprofit organization, and they did a study in 2019. And they discovered that one in five American adults has a diagnosable mental health concern, and one in six kids has a diagnosable mental health concern in America. And so even just with this group of people that's online where it's it's a lot of us you know a lot of us struggle with with something mental health related so as far as kind of warning signs go a couple things to to look out for um if somebody's struggling if you notice kind of a behavior change like somebody's really impulsive all of a sudden um if they have a really big mood swing Another thing is called making arrangements, which might mean that I'm kind of arranging to put my affairs in order. Um, Those are all those are all red flags or those are all things to be on the lookout for if somebody is really struggling with mental health. And a couple of do's and don'ts um, for people that are struggling with mental health. Something to do is if you see that a person is struggling, let them know that they matter and let them know that they're not alone in what they're going through. Um, do not be afraid to, to talk about it really directly with somebody. You're not making things worse if you just are really transparent and open and, and talking about whether or not somebody is thinking about hurting themselves. Um, you're, not being, you're not making things worse if you just directly ask somebody um, if they're struggling with suicidal thoughts. So the more open something is, the less power it has or the less stigmatizing, the less shame um, the less that person feels like they have to hide it or keep it to themselves. Um, other things to do are just to be um, very non-judgmental towards that person, as in not not debating them about the rightness or wrongness of their suicidal thoughts or what they're going through, but just saying, I'm here for you, I want to support you, you matter to me. Um, so not not getting caught up in the, the rightness or wrongness of what that, that person might be going through. One thing that's really important is a is a do not get sworn to secrecy. A lot of times, because suicidal thoughts are really hard to deal with, somebody will ask for secrecy or they'll say, you can't tell my mom or dad or you can't tell my husband or my spouse. And if, if a person says that to you, you can absolutely be respectful and talk about it. You know, tell that person, I really appreciate you trusting me with that information. I'm really, I pre- I'm grateful that you shared that with me. And we're going to need to talk about it with, with other people or with somebody in your life that you trust. So a big thing, again, is not, not getting sworn to secrecy. Um, another thing is do not be dismissive or do not kind of be jokey about what that person is telling you. They're sharing something really difficult with you. Um, and so just to honor that person and honor that they trusted you enough to tell you that they're, that they're struggling. 
um, being taking that seriously can really be a powerful thing. And the biggest thing is just do be there for that person. You know, we all have instincts and we all, so in those situations, it can be really hard because it feels like a high stakes thing, but do trust your instincts and trust, trust your gut and what being walking alongside that person and what they need. Um, we all have good, good instincts, or I trust that everybody has good instincts where they would be able to, to meet that person where they're at. So as far as resources go, what's pretty awesome is we live in the age of the internet where a very fast Google will bring up a whole, a whole lot of resources. Um, there's a lot of crisis numbers that, that we can call. Um, there's a walk-in counseling center on Chicago Avenue in South Minneapolis where you can just go walk in and do a free hour therapy session with therapists that are available. Um, there's therapy practices all over the Twin Cities. And so there are absolutely resources available for, for people that need it. So again, the big thing is a, a lot of times it's just talking about it. I think it's really awesome that the Broken Clock is doing something like this because when we talk about it, when we're open about it, and I don't know where Beth went, but just sharing your story is so, that's so powerful. Um, and I think that does a lot when we, when I love that the beer is called the things, the, the things we didn't say, things we don't say, things we don't say. So we're saying it. We're saying that mental health matters. We're saying that it's okay to, to talk about feelings. And I think that's a pretty powerful thing. Uh, thank you. Again, round of applause for Maddie. Awesome. Talk about a, an amazing resource to have at, at your disposal. So, um, And all of the resources that uh, Maddie mentioned, we will have available 24-7, 365 here at the brewery. So uh, don't worry about remembering all of this. We will have it available if you ever need it. Uh, use us as a resource. And if you are not comfortable uh, using it as a resource openly, come in secretly, pretend like you're getting a beer, check it out, snap a picture, do it on your own. We don't, we don't, all we care is that you get help, not that you advertise you're getting help. So, um, with that, uh, maybe if we could get Maddie, uh, and Elizabeth back up here, there's a few questions that have come in and again, use that Slido app to ask any questions you might have. And with that, we'll get started. Put you on the spot. Um, why are boundaries important? Well, for me, they're important because not everybody needs to know everything that's going on in my life, and I have the right to tell them or not to tell them. Um, that was something that I had to learn with my stepmother when she was alive, and it's not an easy thing to learn, but you are capable of setting your boundaries and sticking to them. And it's important that you do so because there are people that will take advantage of anything that they possibly can. All right, so full disclosure, I love talking about boundaries. <laughs> I love it so much. So if I were to do a, a estimate of how much of my therapeutic work centers around talking around about boundaries, I would guesstimate about 90%. And <clears throat> I have a theory that a lot of most conflict, the root of it can be helped by talking about boundaries. So there's a, a definition of a boundary that I like, which is a boundary is where you end and I begin. And I like to think of a boundary like, like a gate. And a gate kind of lets the good stuff in when you open the gate, and it keeps the bad stuff out. And so if we can have boundaries in our lives, that's so clutch for healthy relationships. We can have boundaries with ourselves, boundaries with social media, boundaries with other people, boundaries with our pets, okay? And boundaries are, again, I think the kind of, you have to have those healthy boundaries in place in order to have healthy relationships. So. Boundaries are important, mostly because I think they kind of undergird um, a lot of our day-to-day -day lives and experiences. 
what are some myths about bipolar disorder? All right, so <laughs> according to the DSM-5, which is offhandedly referred to as the psych Bible, and uh, it's kind of where all the diagnostic criteria is for various mental health concerns or disorders. And so there's two types of bipolar, bipolar one and bipolar two. And <clears throat> a myth of bipolar is that a lot of times people think that having a personality disorder makes you crazy um, or makes you broken. And a lot of times a myth is that if you have something that's in the personality disorder clusters, then you're it's kind of a hopeless situation. Like you're just, you're, you know, it's, it, you can't be treated or um, if you have bipolar, you're, you're crazy or you're broken. And that's just not true. Um, bipolar is a very treatable mental health concern. Um, people that have bipolar, what bipolar is, is essentially difficulty with emotional regulation. So when there's a disorder in place, it's very difficult to keep emotions regulated. And one part of bipolar can be mania, which is when kind of emotions are really, really up and down. And what's cool is through a combination of regular compliance with medication, that's one way of treating bipolar disorder. And what I think is also awesome is DBT, which is dialectical behavioral therapy. And that's totally focused on emotion regulation. And that's one of the go-to standardized gold, gold star treatments for bipolar disorder. But what I think is pretty awesome is as a society, we've grown to a point where we can recognize how our thoughts impact our emotions and behaviors. And when we figure out that something's not working for us, we can edit any one of those three factors to get a different result. So if something isn't working for me, like, like I might not have a good boundary in place, I can change how I approach it. I can change what I think about it in order to get a different result. So all that to say, kind of a myth about bipolar disorder is that that person is broken or crazy or that it can't be treated and it absolutely can and is. What's the connection between shame and vulnerability? These are all great questions. I don't know if I know how to answer that one without thinking about it for a while. It, shame, to me, is when you feel bad for doing something or somebody says something and makes you feel bad. Vulnerability is being able to be open and tell people. So that would be the difference to me probably have more of a clinical answer than I do. <laughs> All right, I'm just going to cite the patron saint of therapy, Brene Brown. And she defines shame as a fear of disconnection from others. And vulnerability, she, she writes a lot about how vulnerability in the past has been synonymous with weakness. And she kind of makes the case that vulnerability, which I love how you said it is openness and transparency, is that actually a real strength. So I would say shame is something that disconnects us from other people, and vulnerability is something that connects us and increases intimacy in our relationships with, with other people. Dan asks, what's the best way to make it known to your friends and family that you are open and available to talk about problems slash mental health? Tell them, be straightforward. Don't be shy about it. Um, I wish I would have had more people in my life younger that were like my friend Kim and, hey, I'm seeing this. You need to do something. You need help. Um, so just sometimes we don't notice it ourselves. We just think that life's out to get us and that's not the truth at all. So if you're willing to be there for somebody, let them know. Be open about it. Don't hide it. Don't beat around the bush of, well, if you want to go out. No, I want to take you out because I see whatever. Be open, straightforward. It's the best way to deal with mental health in general. You're here. I agree with that. Uh, I think... 
it's two things. It's how, how you act and what you say. And a lot of it is the what you say. So just communicating with your words that you're open to talking with people, sitting with people, hearing about people's struggles, and it's what you do. So it's how you show up for people. Are you a person that initiates and asks somebody out for coffee or to come to Broken Clock? Um, or are you somebody that, that, are you in that person's lives I almost, or life? I think about it like kind of like a bank system, you know, like do I make deposits? As in, do I show up for people? Do I, do I invest my time and energy and resources into that person? And I think with communicating with your friends and family that you're available to them, that's where good old boundaries are, uh, our key is that when when you communicate that you're available not intentionally I think but sometimes it can be easy to have that be taken advantage of so that's where communicating an openness and also having good boundaries in place so that you can take care of your own mental health um, that's really key so that you can then be available to others as if you're taking care of yourself and your mental health first how should someone approach therapy when they are anxious about letting a stranger into their trauma slash past? Interview them. <laughs> I can't tell you how many therapists that I've gone to that were disinterested in everything that I was saying. And you could tell because they had their little iPad or whatever, and they, who knows, they were probably writing their thesis for their class or something, but they were not paying attention to what I was saying because I found that the next session I was repeating myself. Um, that to me was a red flag that I need to find somebody different. I need to find somebody that is willing to listen to what I have to say and help me move to the next step. Um, at first I was very shy about telling a therapist that they weren't working for me. Not anymore. Like, sorry, this isn't working. When they ask why, I'm like, you're disinterested in what I'm saying. I, I don't even sugarcoat it anymore. They need to know that you're not a match. And not everybody's going to be a match. And finding yourself a therapist or a doctor or whoever, dentist, it doesn't matter. It's your body. It's your mind. You need to do what's right for you. And that's finding the right person. I 100% agree with that. Speaking from a therapist perspective, when people come in with questions, when they say, what modality are you? You know, how old are you? But that's where my boundaries come in, it's private. Um, I love that, okay? In, as a therapist, what we care about, our number one priority is, do you feel like this is a good fit? Do you feel like that that person is somebody that can help you? Like, I love that you came in with a goal in mind and you said, here's what my goal is, can, can we do this? And so you want, you definitely want to find a person that's that's a good fit. And the fun part, part about therapy, I call this like the secret sauce of why it works, is the confidentiality piece. So you can literally say whatever you want to a therapist, and because of confidentiality, they can't talk about it. They will get thrown in therapy jail if they violate confidentiality. And so confidentiality just gives so much freedom because you, you can know with great confidence what I communicate to this person doesn't at all leave the room. I can say whatever I want. I have total freedom. This person, it's their job to, part of their job is to not judge me and that I can say whatever I want and it's confidential. Awesome. That's it. Um, once again, just a super special thank you to our speakers today, Elizabeth and Maddie. Uh, let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> And like we mentioned before, uh, everything we talked about today and all of these resources we will have available here at the brewery 24-7, 365. If you need something, please let us know. Um, if you're not comfortable talking about something but you still need those resources, they will be here uh, anytime you need them. Uh, and hopefully you're both available if someone has a question down the road that, that they want. In fact, in fact um, starting the third week in October, we are going to have start a happy hour um, talk session here at the brewery. So if you would like to come and join, um, I am by no means licensed and <laughs> anything like that, but I do have a passion and I want to help people get through their day. And sometimes it's easier to just talk to somebody that is there and 
I'm sorry, no offense to you, but sometimes talking to a therapist is not what a person needs. So, yes, you can. <laughs> But so that will start October, uh, third week in October. I can't remember the date right now. So at 5 p.m. Oh, thanks. Stay tuned. We'll uh, post that on all of our channels so you can see that. Um, but once again, thank you for coming out. Thank you for drinking the beer. Um, again, it's called Things We Don't Say. Tell your friends. Tell them to come out and support the cause. Uh, looks like. Can I just say it's a damn fine beer? <laughs> here, here. My official clinical assessment is that it's a good beer. <laughs> so there we go. Um, thank you for your support once again. Um, and if there's anything we can do as a community and as a resource, please do not uh, hesitate to reach out. Um, if you go inside, there's some information about Living Foundation, uh, some really cool wristbands. So we encourage you to please support the cause, tell your friends, and share the message. Thanks. Thank you.